My name is Cecil, Cecil Palmer, uh, pastor of community here at Crossroads Church. There's some of you who know me, some of you who don't. Um, the, the ministries that I get to uh, oversee are men's, women's, young adults, the marriage ministry, next step, and recovery ministry. So there's a, there's a little bit of a a little bit of a juggle between all of those because each one of those ministries are different. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight. I really, truly am. God is good. And uh, that worship team was amazing, weren't they? Very amazing. Yeah, please give them a hand. So uh, I, I have eight kids, just to kind of tell you a little bit about me. I have four boys and four girls. And I really actually have five girls because we have another daughter that's in Florida right now who... Uh, who came into our family at a, you know, in the teenage years and, and grew up with our, our children. And we just kind of took her under our wing and uh, invited her into our family, just doing phenomenal. Five of our kids, my wife Leslie is around here somewhere, um, are in, uh, they're married. Five of them are married. We have one grandbaby, and, uh, but they all love Jesus. And they're all serving the Lord, and we're very blessed and grateful for that. So as our, uh, as our intro there showed on Romans 12.2, um, the message tonight is where is your heart? Is it in the world or is it in his word? It's so important, you know, um, our hearts. God wants good hearts in our lives. He really truly does. And so, you know, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, is it in the world? Is it in the word? You know, and God wants us to be able to pull our hearts from what this world glamorizes as being great. Now, it's a great world we live in, right? You know, we live good lives, um, but God wants more. He really, truly does. He wants our hearts. I, uh, I wrote a little uh, blurb here. It said, the matters of our hearts are forever, a forever changing chameleon. One minute, it, one minute it's great. You know, when things are going good in our life and uh, we're happy with what's happening, maybe we're making good money, we're paying all of our bills on time, we're getting to take vacations and stuff like that, everything's good. But then when something else creeps up and, you know, we have a challenge in our life, we have mistakes we make in our life, we get frustrated, and pretty soon we kind of forget God's there. And, uh, and even in some of those bad areas, you know, it could be we could be losing somebody, we could be having some kind of real bad family matter, and um, then we actually start blaming God. You know, why God this, why God that? So um, we typically just blame him. And, and it's really, for me, our hearts, we need to try our best for our hearts to be the best that they can be. Like the army says, be all you can be. We need to have our hearts that way. So um, when we invite God into our life, you know, we, we come here, we get fed by Pastor Daniel all the time. And we hear good messages, good words from him. And... Um, you know, Jesus, when he was talking about in, uh, in John 13, when he was, uh, or uh, John 7, excuse me, when he was talking about the parables, you know, the parable of the seeds, and he went through all of his, uh, his parables, and then the, the disciples really didn't understand what they meant, so he explained to them, you know, and some of those parables were, I give you my word, you take it into your life. You hear my words, you read my words, but yet you don't apply them to your life. So out of that, you become as basically as sheep out in a pasture, being fed, getting good, good grass, good grains, and then you just get led to the slaughter because we refuse to reply or to apply, excuse me, his word in our lives by not actually replying to him, by not continually asking him to lead us and guide us in our daily walk with him. 
as Paul said, you know, to press toward the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus, you know, and, and to die daily from our lives, from ourselves, for our hearts, because our hearts are very important to God. Our hearts are the lifeline of this body. And those are the areas where Satan knows he can come in and he can creep in. He comes in to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his job. That's his goal. That's all he cares about. He doesn't care about us. He just cares about what damage he can do in our hearts. So we can't focus on God. And he does those in a lot of different ways. Um, Our hearts, God's meant our hearts to be like a fortress. So I'll give you a little example. Um, Everybody knows down in Vancouver, down by the Columbia River there, there's Fort Vancouver. You know where that is, correct? So Fort Vancouver was built to protect. You know, they have those big old log walls with the points sharpened at the top. And uh, the people, they lived inside those communities, pretty much like the big community we live in here. We live inside those communities. So they, they'd close those gates at night when they felt less safe. But they guarded that fortress. They guarded it with towers, with guns, with guards, you know, with the walls. And we really need to view our hearts the same way. God really wants us to, to really guard our hearts like that fortress. Because Satan, the enemy, will come in when we drop our guard, when we leave our gate open to steal, kill, and destroy. It's it's really important for me as a pastor um, to know that my heart is good. And uh, I know... And it's, I know that's just not for me. I know that's for all of us, every one of us. So um, in the guarding of our hearts, you know, God gives us his word. He tells us to, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 16, he says, put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against the wiles of the enemy for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And to have on that shield of faith and that breastplate of righteousness and having our feet ready to run from dangers in our life, run from attacks of the enemy on our heart because it's a spiritual battle. I know like any, every, any one of you guys here tonight, I know that if Satan was standing in front of me physically, I'd be boxing with him. I would be. I'd be fighting him because of what he has done to many of our brothers and sisters in life, in the past, and even now. But we can still box with him by having this right here in our hearts. God desires such an amazing relationship with us, and it's so easy in life and in church to just become complacent in our walk with him. just going through the motions. And a lot of us do, I've done it in my past, just going through the motions of church to make me feel better about the sin I'm living or the sin that I've had in my life. You know, but I, I was raised in church, so that was, that was kind of a, that was just kind of a given for me just because I knew and I'd been in church since I was carried basically from my mom. And, uh, and I come from a big family. I've got two brothers and four sisters. And, uh, you know, I've always said that when we lose the excitement of who Jesus is in our life, when we lose the excitement of, of what he means, and we so easily sometimes forget things that he's done in our lives, especially when we come upon, you know, another test, another trial, something that might be really, really hard. And uh, those are the times, you know, when we need to stand and guard that fortress. And um, I, I just, I 
In 2 Timothy 2.15, God's word says, to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing his word and truth, and to hide my word in your heart so that you don't sin against me. And it's really, for me, it's been real, real easy logic to know that as I'm reading and I'm studying God's word and I'm memorizing it, that I'm pushing more of the world out of my mind and out of my heart, and I'm, I'm uh, inviting more of God into it, more of his desire for my life, um, more of his desire for you guys in your life that he, that he wants. His, he wants relationship with this deep. He doesn't want surface. He does, you know, if you, if you take, uh, you know, you use an alcoholic, for instance, if you have somebody in your family that's an alcoholic and you just say, man, I, I got to get you into rehab. I've got to get you into rehab. And you run them in there and they go through rehab and they come out and they just kind of wind up back in that same life eventually. Same with, you know, drug addictions, sexual addictions, um, gluttony, anything like that. But when God, when that person makes that decision themselves for to God, to actually want that healing at that time, that's when the change actually comes, is when we invite him in. And so um, he loves us. He loves us. And um, his word says, thou shalt love the Lord God with all your heart. There's so many scriptures in the Bible that, uh, you know, I wish I'd actually done the homework on how often it's mentioned about the heart, about our hearts. Um, one of the, how do we protect our hearts? In Philippians chapter four, I wanna read something to you real quick. It says, chapter four, verses seven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds, our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And I can flip through here and I can read verse after verse after verse where God's just saying, I want to be in your heart. I don't want to be on the surface. I don't want to just be in your mind. But I want to be in your heart. So how do we protect it? Through Philippians 4, 7. God's word tells us to rejoice to be excited about him. You know, King David always spoke and he wrote the Psalms. In Psalms 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing and know ye that the Lord, he is God. And throughout many of those scriptures and Psalms that David wrote about, it was about us worshiping God. God has created us to praise him, to worship him, to love him, and as we worship him, it's just not always in prayer, but in song, we're inviting him into our heart, as long as we're opening it up in song. And uh, so by rejoicing, one of those areas we can do it in is we have to rejoice. Um, we have to praise the Lord. There's so many things in life that cause us to be sorrowful. And we can, we can take those things and we can allow them to be in our life or we can choose to replace those with Jesus because he says we can do all things through him who strengthen us and that he won't put any more on us than we can handle. And, you know, for instance, one of those, one of those right now, um, I, I have two brothers and four sisters as I said, and our oldest sister is right now laying in hospice and is ready to just leave any time. That's hard. It is. And uh, one of my younger sisters that's kind of struggling in her life right now. And he posed a question to me. She's just, she was kind of angry, actually. She's, uh, she's been away from the Lord for a while. 
and God's allowing things in her life and he's calling her back in different situations and she hasn't quite grasped onto that yet, but she will, she will. And uh, she just says, I don't understand, you know, once again, I don't understand what God is doing. You know, why is he doing this? Why is he taking our sister? Now, our sister got sick years ago at a very young age. At, uh, I think it was the age of 17. She got a really rare disease called Wilson's disease. And, uh, I mean, it's rare. You've probably never heard about it. It's that rare. And... Um, we were told at that point, the doctors told my parents that, uh, that she would die by 19. But my parents, are, they're believing parents, and they, they wasn't going to have any of that. You know, they, uh, my, they went out and bought hospital beds. We put one in our home, and we put one in the overflow room of the church. And um, we brought Loretta home. And... I remember picking her up and carrying her to that van every Sunday morning before and after church and carrying her from the van into the church, into the bed, and did that Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday nights. You know, and there was times my older brothers did that also, you know, that we, uh, we cared for our sister. I told my sister Christine, my youngest sister, that was questioning, you know, why God was doing this. And I said, you know, hon, I said, we can complain and worry about the five years or ten more years that we're not going to get with Loretta. Or we can thank him for the 39 extra years that he did give us. You know, and I wanted her to see, you know, that actually this water bottle is half right in the middle there. And I didn't do that purposeful. It's kind of funny. Because I always try to view my life as a cup half full and not a cup half empty. And I can only do that by my trust in my father, by my trust in God. And uh, it, it really, it impacted her. It impacted her because nobody loves death. But we all see it and we all face it at some time in our life and um, I'm going to miss my sister. I, you know, we really didn't even expect her to, to be here today. It's just that bad. You know, but the good thing about it is she does know Jesus. And uh, about a week and a half ago, she shared a dream that she had. And that dream was we lost our father just a couple of years ago also. And she said that, uh, that dad was standing at the end of her bed and he told her that it was okay to let go and to come home and that, it, that she would love it there. You know, and that's pretty encouraging, you know. I mean, we know Loretta's heart anyway, and we know that, you know, God's word says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord in a second of time. As she takes her last breath here, she's healed, she's whole, and she's going to be with Jesus. The good thing about the 39 years that he did give us with Loretta is through therapy, through my parents' perseverance, um, she wound up getting married. She wound up having two kids, a son and a daughter. And those kids now have grandkids. So 39 more years, it's pretty huge to me. And I certainly won't ask my sister for one more second to stay here in pain, but go be with our father, because it's only going to be a second in time before we get to meet her there and greet her there. hearts. My sister learned something. And like I said, you know, I know my younger sister, Christine, God's working on her, you know, and that's a good thing. And it won't be long before she graces these doors and comes down and cries out with her heart. 
for God our Father. Um, Proverbs. Chapter 4, verses 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Which it does. Our heart is everything, or our heart is nothing. You know, the Lord says, uh, his Bible, his word tells us that, you know, I'd rather you be hot or cold, a lukewarm person, and I'll spew out of my mouth. Heart issues. That's what those are. In verse 24, it says, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Am I going to go left? Am I going to go right? Or am I going to go forward? And let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or left. Remove your foot from evil. Remove your foot from evil. Problems of the heart, evil talk, gossiping, cheating, cussing, you know, I know we, that some of us have things like that in our life and some of us slip up. But God's word also says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we're making those mistakes and, and some of those things are happening, we need to ponder our heart. We need to ask God where his word and his spirit can apply to our life. And we need to ponder on that every day, on a daily basis. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman profits a lot. The continuous, honest prayer, the continuous, honest studying of his word, the continuous, honest positivity in our lives will do nothing but profit us. It won't belittle us. It won't take us down. It won't change us. Um, God's asked us to run from evil. He asked us to run from evil because our hearts know what that is. We know everything in life is a choice. There's good and bad. There's heaven and hell. There's rich and poor. It's always the extreme from one side to the other. And so... As he asks us to ponder when those things come upon us, we know when the enemy brings that stuff into our hearts whether we should do them. We really do. And if they're just coming out unresponsively, if we're just doing it without thinking, it's because there's too much of that in our heart. Too much of it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So... What would we want to speak? Like I said earlier, I was raised in church. Sometimes forced to go, like I think if you were raised in church, some of you got that also, and you didn't like it. Remember times... I'd get high and go to church just to get through it. You know, I'm serious, guys. My brothers can vouch for that, too. They did the same. <laughs> oh, man. I look back at that. I do, and I was just like, man, Cease, what in the world were you doing? What were you doing? His word says to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord in the ways of Jesus. And they may depart for a season, but they'll always return. That stands huge in my life because I, I did run for a long time. 
my heart. Didn't want to follow my parents at that point. And uh, I was in and out of trouble, using and doing drugs and drinking, and just, it, it just wasn't good. It just wasn't good. But here I am. I remember at 15 years old, and I've, I have a lot, of, a lot of people that can, that remember that, the day when I was there. I remember sitting in church on a Sunday night, stoned that night, and we had an evangelist preaching that night, and I, I didn't know this guy. And um, he was about 20 minutes into his message, and he stopped. And he just, he pointed back over to this side of the room, and he says, you in the blue shirt. And I was just looking around, you know. And he said, yeah, you stand up. And he stood me up in church in front of everybody in the congregation. And he told me, he says, God just spoke to me. And he wants you to know he's calling you into ministry. And he said, I don't know if it's five days, five years, or 50 years from now, boy, but you better get ready. And he said it just like that. And then he said, now sit back down. <laughs> I sat back down, man, and I was scared to death. I truly was. And, you know, it was kind of funny because for many, many years I forgot about that, living life, just doing life. I just, I completely forgot. And I, almost 10 years ago, was, was that time that God said, I guess I want to call it my Moses moment, that uh, he said, it's time. It's time for you to do what I've called you to do. You know, the funny thing about it is throughout the years, I, I, I did go to church still. I was in and out of church. And, and like I said, a lot of times I went to church just to make myself feel good about the sin I was living. But I still went, and I was still shown God's word in my youth. And when I went through hard things in my life, I still picked up this radley old Bible that's fallen all apart that I've had a long time and, uh, and read it. You know, tried to find God in some of those lonely times and those lonely areas of my life that I needed. And uh, didn't always find him because I wasn't quite ready. The heart wasn't quite there. But I responded to that. Here a few years back, almost probably about nine, almost ten years ago. And he just said, it's time. And I knew that. And I walked away from work and I walked away from the life I was living at that time. And chose to just allow God to start changing my heart. And because of that, I'm here tonight. You know, he showed me in dreams stuff just like this. Now, this isn't the first time I've, I've spoken and, and preached. But um, I remember that Moses moment. And it was huge to me. It changed my whole life. And I'll be honest with you guys, I have nothing more, no more desire for anything in life but to get closer to Jesus. And to have him fill my heart and my life with more and more of him. Because I care. You can ask anybody that knows me. I'm, I'm a people person. Um, today's my birthday. Thank you. I turned 52 today. I use these a little more often. You know, more than I want. They, they frustrate me sometimes. And uh, when Pastor Daniel asked me, to speak, he, it was a couple weeks ago. He says, hey, you think you can preach on, on February 11th? And I was like, awesome, yeah, that's my birthday. And he was like, oh, it's your birthday? No, you get a paid day off for that. I'm like, no, man, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be there because that's more important to me. I can celebrate this any time. He's created in my heart a love for people. And, you know, some of you see me out there in the family room before and after services. And, and if you can honestly tell me you haven't seen a smile on my face or seen me happy about being here, I would, I would, have, uh, 
I would, I would just sit there and probably just go head to head with you to try to find out when that was because I don't, I don't think it's there because God means a lot to me and you guys mean a lot. But more than what you mean to me, you mean to him. And you know, and I just want to say something. I got, I got two of my older brothers sitting in here in church tonight and I hope that they're okay with me uh, tattling a little bit on them, but um, they've lived some rough life. Raised in church, just like the rest of us, all seven of us. But they've lived some rough life. But they're here tonight. You know, and I'm just going to, I'll share, you know, One older brother of mine has served, actually both of them, I'll just say it this way, both of them have served more than 23 plus years of their life in the penitentiary. Choices of life, you know, which we all make, but they were raised in church. And as their Moses moments are also, they're here. And I thank God for that. Amen. You know, when you're the the youngest of three brothers, growing up, your heart is just to want to grow up and be like your brothers. And, um, you know, I've, I've made a few other different choices in my life. And there's some areas I didn't go that they went. But you know what? I can still honestly tell you, I have so much love and respect for them that even at 52 years old, I I still want to be like my brothers because I respect them and I honor them and I love them with all of my heart. And I'm proud of them. And I'm proud of them. And I want them to know that. I want you, John and Glenn, to know that. God is good. You guys, really all I want to get through to you is if your heart is not good, make it good. You have that opportunity. You have God's word right here. You have this sword in your life. You have these words to apply to your life that can make you a better son, a better daughter, a better father, a better mother, a better dad, you know, a better brother a better sister, and a better friend. And that's what's important to him, is the matters of our heart. So I'd like to invite the worship team back out real quick. And um, I wrote this here. God's word and his spirit, which was given to us in the choices we choose to follow Christ's example or not, is on us. It's truly on us. It's nobody else's fault but ours. Let's not blame God for our hearts when we have the cure. And that cure is Jesus. Jesus is real to me. And I know he's real to you. You guys are all sitting here tonight because he's real to you. And I'm, like I said, I am honored to be part of this family, this church, Um, So church, are we at peace with him? Is our heart good? And I just want to read one more scripture with you. And actually this one just kind of popped into my head here. A tree known by its fruit in Matthew chapter 12. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. That's our choice. He gives us the opportunity to praise him, to rejoice in him. And really, I'll be honest with you, I think if, there, if we're not rejoicing in our Lord Jesus Christ, I, in, in my own personal life, I look at that as sin in my life when I don't praise him and worship him. 
You know, there's an old Dallas Home song. I don't know if many of you out there know who Dallas Home is. You know, there's an old Dallas Home song that was one of my, fra- my favorites, and it, was, it went, praise the Lord. He can work through those who praise and praise the Lord for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they'll drop powerless behind you when you praise him. And that's what we have for our hearts. We have that opportunity to praise him. We have that opportunity to serve him. You know, I want to be a good dad. And according to my kids, I guess I am. I got a lot of good messages from them today. I've got kids all over the world, you know, older son and daughter-in-law just got back from Cambodia and Vietnam. They're missionaries for YWAM. Um, the daughter over in Amsterdam now, a daughter in Hawaii, the other one in Florida, you know, the rest of them around here. But they're, man, they've turned into world travelers, my kids. But you know, the cool thing about it is when they're gone, I don't worry. I'm excited for what they're doing because they're out there reaching people for Jesus. They're out there going through hard things. I spoke with my son when he was in Cambodia and he told me, he says, this is one of the hardest missions we've ever brought a group on because they take kids all around on these mission trips. And he said it's been the hardest one over there with little babies, you know, running around naked with no clothes, not, not a stitch, you know, digging through garbage, things like that. Man, we have it good, guys. Brothers and sisters, we have it good in this country that we live in, and we should not take that for granted. And it should be simple for us to have good hearts because of how blessed we are. It should be simple for us, but it's gotta be your choice to be simple. It's gotta be your choice. Are our hearts in the right place? Is Christ just around the surface of our hearts? Or is he embedded deep inside? I want him embedded deep inside in my life. And I pray you do also. So where are our hearts? Are they in the world? Or are they in his word? Can we pray? Father God, we love you. I know, Lord God, that um, you never want to...